Hello again, I'm Enrique Martinez Meyer. I'm a professor at the National University of Mexico here in Mexico City, and this is the second time I'm participating in this course. Thank you, Town, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And uh, this time I'm going to talk to you about one of the most uh, popular implementations of ecological niche modeling, which is uh, model transfer or model projection from from one time to different time periods. So uh, let me get started with my presentation. Well, uh, before going to the actual process of modeling niches and transferring them uh, across time, let me tell you some very important conceptual issues that you need to know and bear in mind every time you do this kind of exercises. First of all, it is not the same thing to project a model to, to past times than project a model to future times. Even though in, in terms of, of the process, of the mechanical process, it's basically the same, conceptually is, is different. And this is because there is only one past. So when, when we go to the past using ecological niche model, models, we want to to discover that past and to understand why things were in the way they they were how species have responded to previous climatic changes or how climate have impacted species and uh, whereas when we project to future climates we want to anticipate what the possible responses of species or impacts of, of climate would be on, on biodiversity. So it's, it's a difference, it's a very important difference here. And uh, this difference relies on, on the existence of data. For, for the past, it depends on how far in the past we go, we can have data to, to uh, formulate a hypothesis and test that, that hypothesis. Uh, so we have occurrence data. It depends on, on, on the time slice you are looking at for past uh, uh, scenarios. We have climatologies for the near past, for example, the, a few decades ago or or far in the in the past like like millennia like in the holocene mid holocene or in the pleistocene so uh as you go farther back in the past of course you you face different problems in terms of data in terms of of climatic reconstructions it's it's uh, more uncertain on one hand, but also the, we we face the scarcity of data, and uh, when, when we go to to the to the far past in terms of fossil records, for example, and when we did, when you use fossil records for modeling or for validating your models, you have to to be very conscious of the limitations of this type of information. Well, whereas when when you model for the future and uh, we didn't have occurrence records for for the future of course so we cannot strictly speaking we cannot test hypotheses but only formulate hypotheses on how climate can impact species and how species may respond to those climatic changes so uh for the future we we face different problems because we don't we don't know how the future is going to be. We have many different scenarios or, or possibilities on how this future could be. And many of them are equally likely. So uh, we have a, a big deal of uncertainty in, in future projections, which is something that we have to live with and to handle. Well, uh, so you Based on these differences, you can address different questions for the past than for the future. 
for the past, you you may want to know where was the species in, in a specific time period and how that species that was in, in some place in a remote time came to be in a different place in recent times. And you can investigate how that species responded and, and how much climate was a factor for, for uh, shifting the distributions and things like that. If you model more than one species, you can ask questions regarding the biotic uh, community composition, for example, what species live with, with what other species in, in a specific time in the past. Whereas for the future, all your, your questions have a, a may in, inside. How climate change may affect the distribution of a species? We know we cannot test a hypothesis. We we can postulate or formulate hypotheses, and uh, we can approximate to test those hypotheses if we incorporate other type of information, and that that kind of approaches us to to the future. For example population trends or population genetic, genetics or some sort of that information that, that uh, can help to interpret our results. And another sort of questions that we have addressed with, this, with these approaches is in terms of, of landscape. For example, uh, how the, the current protected area system would be useful for for the future if species shift their distributions and things like that. Well, but the main message here is that reconstructing the past is not the same as anticipating the future. So modeling for the past is not the same as modeling for the future. So it's very important to, to ask the right questions in, in each case. And I say this because it is very common, mainly for people that it's beginning in this field, that they do projections to the past or to the future because it's, it, it is possible to do, to do it and not because they have a specific and, and well settled question to, to address or to, to answer. So uh, before starting, a modeling process, you have to find out what is the question that you you want to, to ask. And if ecological niche modeling is the appropriate ap approach for addressing such question. And if that is true, then you have to think very carefully on your modeling strategy. That being said, let me start with explaining how is the process, which is not very different from what you have learned uh, along this course and how to produce a good ecological niche model. Okay, let me explain you this uh, illustration here. We start in the bottom left panel, input data, it's for, for producing a model, you, you have to do exactly the same as for producing a model without uh, transferring it. You have to have your set of, of presence and presence and absence data or pseudo absences and the set of environmental variables and that correspond to the niche dimensions for, for that specific species. The difference when you transfer a model here is that you need to have uh, a set of the same environmental variables as for the present for, for different alternative scenarios, right? But in, in terms of, of input data, it's the same thing. Then uh, you use your um, knowledge on, on how to produce a robust uh, niche model with uh, 
choosing the right algorithm and uh, making a lot of testing to uh, identify the right parameter metrization for for that specific species and set of data with the idea of make the best characterization of, of the niche possible. Once you have uh, characterized your niche correctly, you have your, your right model, you have to project that model into the geography, back into the geography, which is to say that you will produce as uh, many potential distribution maps as you have uh, climatic scenarios. You have your calibration scenario that normally is for the present, and then you have alternative uh, climatic scenarios for different time periods, so you will produce a, a map for each one of those time periods. Then uh, you have to do what you normally uh, do for your, your analysis. You have to validate your models. In the case of, of model projections or, or transference to different time periods, specifically for the past, if you have information on the occurrence data for species into those past time periods, you use them for validating your models as well. And uh, there is something different here in terms of the environmental uh, variables or scenarios. When you transfer a model to a different to a different time, it is possible, it is very possible that you can find environmental combinations, different environmental combinations in this other scenario than in the calibration scenario. This is called non-analog uh, climates. And this is a, a very important issue in, in model transferences because uh, you challenge your, your algorithm to estimate a probability of presence or, or a suitability score for a combination of, of, of climates, of values of the climates that the algorithm doesn't know. So this is something that you have to understand very well. And I'm sure that uh, Hannah Owens is going to, is also presenting one lecture on, on extrapolation and she will address this issue of, of climate similarity. Um, in, in depth. I will touch that a little bit more further in the, in the talk, but this is something that you have to bear in mind. And finally, because you can produce a lot of, a lot of models for one single scenario and time slice, because you, you have a lot of uh, general circulation models, for example, for future scenarios, then you have to to handle a lot of, of information. And there are different ways to measure the variability among these models and, there's, and the uncertainty associated to, to all these different uh, models and uh, general circulation models, I mean, and uh, climatic scenarios. Well, it's also a common practice in ecological niche modeling to, to test these transferences with not only with one algorithm, but with a, a suite of, of different algorithms. So at the end, you have also to compare all of them together. We will see how to do that. I will go in detail in each one of these steps a little bit uh, farther. But first, I want to mention you some of the basic assumptions when we are working with, with uh, models or we are transferring models over time. First, we assume that uh, the uh, niche of the species remains conserved or constant through time. This means that evolution doesn't occur. And this could be true or, or not. It depends on what species we are we are working with, and what is the time span that we are also uh, working. 
if we are transferring models to the near future or the near past, this is probably a, a very sensible uh, assumption. But if we are transferring models to distant times in the past, for example, to the, the I don't know, uh, last glacial maximum, which is 21,000 years ago, uh, we probably this is not the case. This assumption doesn't hold true. So it's important that we know that this is something that we are working with. Another, another assumption is that the relationship of the species with the environmental variables remain constant uh, through time. So it, for example, if, if one variable is the main driver or the, the, the limiting fac factor in one time slice in the present, in the calibration time, uh, that variable will be also the limiting factor in, in the projections in different time slices. Uh, also, uh, this is not properly an assumption, but this, it's, it's a wish that uh, in our modeling, we are uh, embracing all the full range of conditions for the species. And this relates to the configuration of, of the BAM. Uh, sometimes species are not restricted by environmental conditions, but uh, for example, if they live in, in, in an island, probably their, their niches are much broader than the conditions offered by the geography. And that it's a problem when you transfer models, this niche truncation. And uh, also we assume that the occupation of space is not uh, environmentally biased by demographic, biotic, or human interference noise, which uh, means that with the characterization, with, with the occurrence data that we have for, for characterizing the niche, we are hoping that we can uh, have all those environmental conditions where the species can live. And this is, of course, not always the case. So let's go uh, to, the, to the modeling process itself. First, the first step is to prepare our data. And we need to do exactly what you know to do uh, for, for generating a, a mo an niche model. We have to gather and collate occurrence records for the species. This is an example with the volcano rabbit. Uh, it's an endemic species from central Mexico. And you know that you have to clean your, your data. And of course, if you have, for example, if your, if your goal is to transfer models to the past and you have information for the past distribution of the species maybe with fossil records or other form of information like genetic information or, or something it's important you have that at hand well uh, one recommendation here is that it's very important to put as much time as necessary in this in this step of the process. Everybody knows, we all know that uh, doing uh, and cleaning a database, it's boring and it's not a very nice work, but it's a very important one. You have to do all your effort to have the best database possible for for your for your modeling and another important issue here is that you it's important here to to match your temporal uh, or to match temporally your occurrence data with your environmental data for for calibrating so if you have records of, of for example this species from the 20th century and the 21st century, it's important that, that your climatologists for, for calibrating your models 
match the, the time period of, of your records. Uh, well, you clean all your database, of course, and you remove your dubious records and things like that. And I strongly recommend that, that you analyze your data, not only geographically, not only to put your, your points in your, in your map, in a map, but also in the environmental space. In that way, you can see if there are some some suspicious records that don't uh, that are kind of outliers, and you analyze very carefully those those records. Then you have to to prepare your environmental layers first to decide what layers to use for calibrating your models and use those ex exact layers for for the future or the past uh, scenarios that you are analyzing. Of course, you have to prepare your data cut them in the same extent and uh, then to to make a selection of of your environmental variables i i am sure you now understand the importance of of selecting the right uh, environmental layers for for your modeling remember that if you use too many layers you tend to overfit your models. It, there are some algorithms like Maxent that it has an internal process of model selection. And in those algorithms, this is a low risk. But there are many other algorithms that they don't do that. So they use all the information that you input. So be careful in this, in this step. And also, if you use too few layers, this tends to overestimate. The, the distribution of species and uh, also it's important to make a, an appropriate selection of, of your of your variables because collinearity you will see uh, a talk about collinearity and the effects on of model performance specifically for for transferences and uh, it this is an important topic that you have to bear in mind and uh, in terms of, of uh, climatic scenarios for the future specifically, it is very important that you understand what they, they mean in order to be able to select the adequate uh, scenarios and models for your, your purposes. I will talk a little bit more about that later. For example, uh, in terms of selecting the, the variables for modeling, this is the way I do it. Doesn't mean that this is the right way or the only way. This is only the way I do it. I combine different approaches to, to make my, my final selection. I run a, co a correlation analysis and I also run uh, a maxim because it has this uh, method for, for uh, assigning the importance of, of environmental variables. And I do a lot of testing with different combinations of variables based on these two analyses and, and look at the model performance with each one of those combinations. And in that way, I decide what variables I am going to use. In the case of this is the case of the volcano rabbit. I use of the, the 19 bioclimatic variables that are popular in Borglim and other that databases. And I ended up with uh, a set of eight variables, which were not the same as suggested by the correlation analysis or the maxent. Uh, analysis. I also used information from my knowledge on the biology of this rabbit and decided between two variables, specifically between the, the minimum temperature of the coldest month and the mean temperature of the, of the warmest quarter, because they were highly correlated. They are bio 6 and bio 10 respectively and if you see the table here 
you will see that they have a very strong correlation so i don't need to use both but i decided the the bio 6 in this case well now that i have my my right set of environmental variables and i have my my occurrence records clean i go to calibrate my models you know all about calibration to this point i i hope and uh, well in in model transferences across space or time it is a common practice and it is recommended to use more than one algorithm for for modeling this is because algorithms even even though they can perform well for the calibration scenario when you transfer them to different uh, scenarios they they may do different things and that's a, that's a big problem and they do different things because they are programmed differently uh, for example for example when when you, they face uh, non analog climates i will touch this a little bit further also you have to parameterize your your uh, your uh, model in the calibration scenario i make uh, a very strong point here because i have seen many times that people that are beginning in, in the field they want to produce for example a, a distribution potential distribution model for a future scenario but they use the occurrence records for the present on top of the environmental variables for the future and that's a big mistake please don't do that because that's a huge mistake so you have to calibrate your model in the same time frame of your occurrences and your climate okay then you have well you calibrate your model you do all your testing you know that calibrating models is 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 not an easy task it's complicated but uh, then you get your your best model possible from the different uh, algorithms and you have to validate them in the calibration scenario and if you have information for your your alternative scenarios you validate the models in the alternative scenarios you can do that for past scenarios but not for for future scenarios from now on you can do future validation for example if you calibrate your model with uh, historical climatic scenarios and historical occurrence records and transfer that uh, model for example to the present uh, time climatic scenario and then use current occurrences to validate that transference and it's a transference from the past to the present that that's that's valid and uh, for calibrating your models you have to do a lot of testing uh, you have seen in different lectures of this uh, along this course that calibration has become more and more complex because we are learning a lot about how models work and uh, normally you have to do a lot of testing for different parameters in one algorithm and then if you are using different algorithms you have to do the same for all of them so it is not uh, automatically as many people think it is and uh, the calibration will depend as you as you know now uh, on the BAM configuration if if uh, the distribution of the species that you are working with follows what town has termed the Wallace dream you will find uh, truncated niches which is a problem as opposed to a uh, Hutchinson dream in which only the environmental conditions limit the distribution of the species and that's an ideal scenario well we have uh, understood that not all species are 
good candidate for for modeling and for for projecting models to different times if you cannot produce a reliable model for the calibration scenario you you just simply don't try to 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 transfer it to a different scenario because that's you you will you will be inventing something and it's not reliable what you would do in under those circumstances so uh in the calibration process it's very important that that you you analyze very carefully your results you you have to compare what you get with one model i mean in the calibration scenario eh? what uh, what what it looks like with with one model and with a different model for example in this slide you can see in the left side of the, the the map of the left it's a model produced with bioclim in the map of the right is it's a model produced with the same points with an ellipsoid algorithm and you see they are different so you have to validate them to decide which ones are robust and use those and uh, it's strongly recommended that you don't know, don't don't see only the maps but also analyze the structure of your distribution in environmental space and you will learn a lot of looking at the at the model in in different uh, combination of of environmental variables and probably most importantly in in all this is to check out the response scores. If you work with uh, Maxent, for example, it's one of the beauties of that algorithm and, and software, is that it produces those response scores. And those are very, very useful to understand what is going on with your model and what variables are important for your species and how uh, convenient or robust your your um, transferences to different time slices could be well now let's take a quick look at one of these variables let's let's pay attention to bio 3d the bottom line here there are three different uh, parameterizations of, of maxim with free extrapolation in the left with extrapolation with clamping in the center and with no extrapolation and no clamping in the in the right hand side as you can see the most favorable conditions for this rabbit uh, is in the upper up, uppermost val values of, of bio 3 but it happens that it's truncated which means that in the area of where, where this species lives there are no conditions beyond this value of bio 3 even though these are the, the best conditions for the species according to this model so what would happen on the climate change scenario in which in which this uh, variable goes beyond six eight six hundred and eight well if you allow maxim to to extrapolate it can extrapolate to the infinite and that's something very risky because you would say that the probability of the presence for this species could could be very high even in environments that are not suitable for the species so i'm not going in depth in this because uh, hannah owens is going to talk about this uh, very clearly and in depth but i just want to make the point here that parametrization of, of the algorithms is, is something that you have to be very careful about when you are uh, doing transferences. Now, uh, once you have your, your calibration done in the best way possible for each one of the algorithms, you run your final models, you have your, your final models and you transfer those models to the different uh, climatic scenarios, the past or to the future. 
And then you have to evaluate the climatic uh, similarity among these scenarios with respect to the calibration scenario. And this is very important to identify non-analog climates. I will talk to uh, about this a little bit further. And then you have to compare the output of all your algorithms for the calibration and for the uh, projected uh, scenarios. <laughs> and you will be horrified with the results. And then uh, you will find out that there are some models that does, don't, don't make sense, that produce results that really don't make sense. So you don't have to keep those. You have to select those algorithms that are producing uh, sensible or reliable models. And uh, finally, make some uh, evaluation and uh, quantification of variability and uncertainty. Let's go uh, further on this. Well, first, what climate scenarios you, you are going to use for the past? Because there is only one past. We don't have properly, we, we don't have scenarios, we have models. We have different laboratories that have uh, developed uh, reconstructions of the past. And as we have many algorithms to produce niche models, we also, there, there are also many models, general circulation models, GCMs, that produce uh, climate reconstructions for the past. And they differ, they may differ a lot uh, between them. And which one is better, it, it's not a, a right answer for that. Some of them work better for some regions. And so it's it's a matter of, of testing them also. But for the future is a different story. For the future we have, we, we not only have GCMs, but we have different scenarios, different, uh, different uh, possibilities for the future in terms of emissions uh, or the carbon load in the atmosphere and how that translate, translates into different uh, temperatures in the future. Here you, in, in the slide, you can see on the left, uh, left hand all the different possibilities for, for uh, models or climatologies for the past, for the mid-Holocene, and for the last climate, uh, glacial maximum in the, in the Pleistocene from uh, Wortling. But there are other climatologists out there, for example, Chelsea, that also have a collection of, of models for the past and models and scenarios for the future. So you can have literally thousands of possibilities or at least hundreds of possibilities for, for uh, selecting different uh, conditions specifically for the future. So you need to go a little bit into the literature to understand what RCPs represent, these uh, representative concentration pathways that are very popular and you can go to the IPCC and from there to different sources to understand what those scenarios mean and also what the SSP, the socioeconomical pathways also, what do they mean and what are the combinations that you can use from CCPs and RCPs and then for each RCP you have a lot of laboratories building models. So each one of those lines in the in the graph on your right is one model that you could potentially use. So as you can see, you can have hundreds of possibilities. So what would you do with so many possibilities? You normally you choose some of them and you want it's a common practice, for example, to you want to see a an optimistic world in which it's going towards uh, sustainability and this is represented by the RCPs, the low uh, RCPs like 2.6 or lower or you, you can see a pessimistic world 
that goes to the red lines, to the, RC, the, the high RCPs, the 6 or the 8.5, etc. So it's a matter of investigating and understanding what these models are, what they represent, and how you can use them, or what you, um, the way you want to use them. And then there are other tools out there that help you to decide what what GCMs, for example, represent more variability in, in the whole group of, of GCMs for one scenario. You can see which ones for that, for your specific uh, study region, what represents more extreme climates or, or more conserved climates. So it's a whole world. Now we have to uh, do also an analysis of the similarity between the climates of the calibration scenario with respect to the alternative scenarios. There are different techniques to do that or different methods to do this, but all of them are multivariate analysis in the environmental space that, that measure the distance between uh, the values of each one of the variables of the calibration uh, scenario and the, the distance with respect to the alternative scenarios. So uh, you get a map that identifies those pixels in which there are values beyond either uh, higher or lower to the values of the calibration scenario. And it produces a map showing those pixels so it is very important and it's very useful to have that information because it's very risky to do assumptions or to do inferences on, on those pixels. So this is a very important uh, uh, step in the, in the process. Uh, you have also to do some evaluation of the variability of, of, the, of the models that you obtain. There are different sources of variability that, that give uh, or produce uncertainty in your modeling. One of them is if you are using different algorithms, you can have different output from, from these algorithms. Even if they perform very well under co current conditions, they may produce very different results in transferences, as you can see in this image. These are maps produced or transferred from, from the same set of, of uh, occurrence records and environmental variables, but using different algorithms. And you can see that they, they look very different. They are very different. And you have two possibilities here, that some of them are very wrong or that all of them are very wrong, but you don't know when you are projecting to the future. So, it is important that you use your, your knowledge on species and, and your knowledge on the geographic region that you are working with to, to have a sense of what is, uh, what, which of those algorithms are doing, if not a good job, at least a, a sensible job that makes some sense. Okay? And this happens because of, of how algorithms handle uh, this issue of non-analog non climate in, in alternative scenarios and how they work for, for producing uh, transferences, which they, they work differently. Uh, another source of, of variability, of variation, and that also produces uh, uncertainty is the difference between the GCMs and the, and the scenarios. Uh, as I told you, you can have many different GCMs for one single scenario on time slice. You can see in this image, this is from, uh, from the, the World Clean 2, the different uh, models or GCMs that you can have. Those are the rows that you can have for the different scenarios, which are the columns. Uh, one rule of thumb in this type of analysis is that you, you don't have to compare or to combine uh, different scenarios. You can 
combine and compare the models within one single scenario but because these are different the, the scenarios are different different futures different worlds so uh, you can make comparisons to say well in in a, an optimistic world this may this could happen and uh, as opposed to a very uh, extreme or pessimistic world in that in that sense you can compare them but if you want to combine uh, models, you you should not combine models um, between different scenarios, only within the, the same scenario. Okay. Uh, and how do you compare and combine that? Well, there is also different techniques to to combine models, and it's called sample modeling. Uh, sometimes when you combine models. The, the resulting combination uh, performs better than the single models but sometimes it doesn't and think about it if you have a, mo a model an algorithm or a model that performed very well if you combine that one with others that did not uh, perform that well you are reducing the quality of the model that, that uh, worked well so for doing examples first you have to evaluate the single models and you have to discard those that are not uh, performing well okay and there's another issue that not many people think about it there are even our packages like like bio mode that have a model for for um, making ensembles but there are different ways of, of doing ensembles you can if you if you obtain uh, continuous maps for example with scales from zero to one probability uh, probabilistic maps uh, you can combine them with uh, weighted means or by means or, or by averaging them or some some thing like that but personally i'm not very keen to do that because uh, those scores those probability values may represent different things may express different things for for algorithms of uh, present substance like like limbs and gams those are estimations of the probability of the presence of a species whereas for other algorithms that you can score them in in a scale from zero to one for example a bioclean or uh, or uh, ellipsoids those are distances to the to the niche centroid which is not the same as probability of presence or even maxent we don't know exactly what the scores of maxent represent the c log log is more close closely to probability of presences but the but the raw scale is more more related to the suitability of the area for the species so if you have different expressions of the suitability of a place for for the species and you combine them it's for me it's that you are combining peers with apples and that's that's not correct what you can do in such case is to binarize those models to convert them to presence and absence and in that way even if you have probabilities of presences or, or distances to, to to the centroids if you you make binary maps out of them now you have the same things you are comparing apples with apples because you have presences versus substances and then you can combine them but of course you you lose information in terms of of the different quality of the of the habitat for the species so there is there is a lot of interesting uh, topics in ensemble modeling so uh, it's important that you also document yourself uh, on this and i will provide you with some literature for that well then what you already have your best models you did the right uh 
thing in each one of the steps and you produce your your bunch of models for the for the past or for the future you have your your model for the present also and uh, you are sure that you did it right now what well now is the end of, of, of modeling is the beginning of your research it, you you have done only the 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 workshop uh, work and now you have to use your other information and your brain to address your questions you have to to read very carefully your results to understand them to go, to give a very good interpretation of, of them you have probably depending on the question that, that you have formulated in the beginning to use ancillary information to post-process your your maps for example you can use land cover information or land cover scenarios for the future to combine them with climate change scenarios and and produce what you are looking for so uh, after this uh, hard work of producing good models now you can start working on on your question so i think this is it in terms of of the procedure of of doing uh, models and transferring models for different time scenarios but as you can see there are many many loose issues in the whole process is in each step of the of the process so most of the research now is focusing on on uh, how to reduce uncertainty and how to make these uh, transferences more realistic so uh, how to incorporate biotic interactions into into these uh, modeling uh, procedures or or the history by integrating phylogenetic or phylogeographic approaches and information into this um, and uh, modeling beyond beyond the presence of the species but we for example in our group we are working on on modeling uh, abundance of species or other fitness traits of, of populations so uh, this is this is a very active research field uh, and i hope you you feel excited and motivated to to continue in this in this line there are different levels of 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 uh, users in, in ecological niche models and uh, we need more people in the in the development side in the development of ideas and implementations uh, so i i hope you find this interesting and just as, as conclusions to close this talk remember that uh, it's very easy to produce uh, niche models and very easy to project them to different time slices but it's very easy to do it wrong so you have to be very careful in each one of the steps that you take here uh, this is also as other aspects of the modeling an intellectual exercise more than a hands-on exercise you have to think very carefully what you are doing and uh, making the right decisions in, in each one of the steps and uh, remember this modeling niches to the past is not the same as modeling niches to the future you have different purposes and, and different procedures to do so so uh, finally uh, we are all are involved in 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 this field we are learning and we continue to learn there are a lot of things that we need to de develop and understand so i hope you feel motivated to continue in this line thank you very much and if you need to contact me please feel free to write me to this email i will be very happy to to help you in whatever i can
Thank you very much.